Grand Duchess Elizabeth Fyodorovna was a princess, the sister of the Russian Empress and a royal Romanov martyr. One of the most easily recognizable tiara styles from the late 19th century is the Kokoschnik, and Grand Duchess Ella had one of the most recognizable. Let's learn more about the jewels of Elizabeth Fyodorovna, Grand Duchess Ella, who was the wife of Moscow martyr Grand Duke Sergei. You can learn more about the couple and their marriage in this video on this channel. Grand Duchess Ella's Emerald Kokoschnik. This halo-shaped tiara was designed to mimic the traditional headdresses worn by Russian women, and accordingly they were popularized by the women of the Romanov court. Grand Duchess Ella's striking diamond and emerald Kokoschnik, with its paisley design on hard felt, started off in Imperial Russia, but the upheavals of the 20th century led it on a very interesting journey. The large cabuchon emeralds that formed the centerpiece of the tiara originally belonged to Grand Duchess Ella, who was the sister of the last Tsarina. According to Stefano Papi, the gemstones were presented to Ella by her fiancé, Grand Duke Sergei, on their engagement in 1884. He had held on to the emeralds for years after the death of his beloved mother. The emeralds were a part of a complete parer of jewels, which you can see in various photographs and fancy court dress worn by Grand Duchess Ella. The set included the kokoschnik, an elaborate long necklace, earrings, and an impressive stomacher. In 1887, Grand Duchess Ella posed for a series of court portraits wearing the complete emerald set. But you'll note that the kokoschnik she wears in photographs is different from the tiara as we know it today, as it is referred to as the Yugoslavian emerald tiara in its new form. At some point, the tiara was modified. The piece is often attributed to Bolin. It may have been originally made by the jeweler and then later remodeled by another jeweler or remodeled by Bolin himself. Either way, the Russian court jeweler is said to have played a part in the Kokoschnik's construction at some point. Grand Duchess Ella was remembered as wearing beautiful gowns made of glacier blue, so it's interesting Grand Duke Sergei chose the green emeralds, domestically produced in Russia, for his bride who would come to love Russia so much. The curved diamond paisley ornaments on the Kokoschnik are very similar to a suite of dress ornaments that had belonged to Empress Catherine the Great, and you can learn more about her jewels on this channel. The diamond ornaments on the hard felt Kokoschnik were included in the 1922 photograph of the Russian imperial jewels laid out on a table after seizure by the Bolsheviks. You can see them on a plaque behind the tiaras, and so they may have been kept in the Alexander Palace where the Bolsheviks stole them after the remodeling of the Kokoschnik by Bolin. Grand Duke Sergei and Grand Duchess Ella resided at the magnificent Belovsky Belovsky Palace in St. Petersburg, and when she entertained, it was said, she would go upstairs in the middle of the ball to change into a new dress, even more beautiful than the last, and an even richer set of jewels. In 1908, Grand Duchess Ella gave her emerald set as a wedding present to her niece and de facto adopted daughter, Grand Duchess Maria Pavlovna, who married Prince Wilhelm of Sweden. Around this time, we see the traditional paisley pattern of the hard felt Kokoschnik change to an Art Deco series of crisscrossing diamonds. Maria Pavlovna was generally called the Younger to distinguish her from the other Grand Duchess Maria Pavlovna, who is known in jewelry circles as the first owner of the Vladimir Tiara. After the bloody Russian Revolution, Maria Pavlovna the Younger went into exile in Paris and Romania, where she decided to sell the tiara to ostensibly pay for some of the apartments she and her brother, Grand Duke Dmitri, shared. You can learn more about the exiled Prince Dmitri on this channel. In 1922, Princess Maria of Romania was preparing to marry King Alexander I of Yugoslavia. 
her mother, Queen Marie of Romania, heard that Maria Pavlovna the Younger, who also was Queen Marie's first cousin, was planning to sell her jewels. She encouraged Alexander to buy the tiara as a wedding gift. He did, and the tiara became one of the pieces the Romanian queen wore most often during her queenship. It was also later worn by her daughter-in-law, Queen Alexandra of Yugoslavia, who reportedly disliked the tiara because of its weight. The necklace from Grand Duchess Ella's Perer was remodeled, transforming it into a massive, fashionable satois. Queen Marie remembered her aunt and prior owner of the tiara as follows. She was quite newly married when her beauty burst upon me as a marvelous revelation. Her loveliness was what used to be called the angelic kind. Her eyes, her lips, her smile, her hands, the way she looked at you, the way she talked, the way she moved, all was exquisite beyond words. It almost brought tears to your eyes. It was only your earthly beauty they were able to do away with, but the memory of your charm, your goodness, your loveliness, live with us forever like a star in the night. I was but a child when I so worshipped you, but your face was a revelation. The picture I still have of it is one that no ugliness of life can ever efface. Your end was tragic, abominable, not to be thought of, a blot on humanity, but you did exist once. And blood cannot wipe out the vision of you passing before me, like a blessed apparition in your gown, the color of glaciers, the color of aquamarine. King Alexander was assassinated in 1934, and Queen Marie's young son, Peter, became King Peter II. He was deposed during World War II, and the entire family went into exile. In 1953, it was Queen Marie's turn to sell the tiara. This time, the buyer was Van Cleef and Arpels. In a move that recalls the earlier treatment of the emerald tiara of Empress Mary Louise of France, and you can learn more about Empress Josephine's jewels on this channel, the jewelry house removed the valuable Romanov emeralds, sold them, and replaced them with paste. One more Serbian princess got the chance to wear the tiara after the emeralds were removed. Van Cleef loaned the Kokoschnik to Princess Elizabeth, daughter of Prince Paul and Princess Olga. You'll sometimes see the tiara, but not the emeralds, on display today, as the jewelry firm occasionally loans it out to various exhibitions. Next is the emerald brooch given to Grand Duchess Ella by her husband, which originally belonged to her mother-in-law, Empress Marie of Russia. According to Royal Magazine Deutschland, the main piece in Grand Duchess Ella's set was the diadem in coconut style, set with high-cut round emerald cabochons and diamonds. The seven large emerald diamonds were decorated with a wreath of large diamonds and set in an open-worked, strictly geometric ornamentation of interlocking diamond motifs after its update by Bolin. The surrounding diamonds were set with large diamonds, a border, and small stylized lilies of the valley inserted, a symbol that stands for love and happiness and, of course, is also a Christian symbol. Lilies of the Valley were a very popular motif in Russia, which later, from about 1905 on, was also taken over by Cartier, and can be found in many of his creations, even as his trademark was. The semi-rigid, heavy ascending frame of the Kokoschnik dictates the form, something that allows only a few variations. The approximately 4 by 45 centimeter golden emerald brooch can be seen, and it was probably also created in Russia around 1840. It is also decorated with a large emerald and many smaller diamonds and diamond roses. After the Grand Duchess parted with her jewels in 1905, she gave this brooch to her brother, the Grand Duke Ernst Ludwig von Hessen Darmstadt. Subsequently, his younger son, Prince Ludwig of Hessen by Rhine, passed it on to his niece, Princess Dorothea. The brooch was sold in 1996 to an unknown buyer. 
The elegant aquamarine and diamond parure is composed of an unsigned tiara in the garland style set throughout with rose and cushion shaped diamonds and decorated with five pear shaped aquamarines, along with its necklace signed by Fabergé, designed as a line of step cut aquamarines in rose diamond borders connected by cushion shaped and rose diamond ribbon bow motifs and a similar bracelet. Although this tiara belonged to Grand Duchess Ella, it has been known as the Hess Aquamarine Tiara. Grand Duke Sergei gave the different pieces of this aquamarine and diamond parure to his wife around 1900, and while she was not photographed wearing the piece, she seems to have worn the tiara without the aquamarines for a few portraits. Perhaps he picked up on his bride's love of the color blue, the same color she was wearing when he was assassinated by Zionist Bolsheviks. After his assassination in 1905, his wife sold or distributed her legendary jewelry collection about relatives, according to the Royal Watcher blog and the Court Jeweler blog. While most of the major jewels were given to her niece, the aqua aquamarine tiara and Fabergé Perreur was given to her brother, Grand Duke Ernst of Hesse and by Rhine, who married later that year in 1905, but she was not pictured wearing the aquamarine tiara. In 1959, the last Prince of Hesse gifted the now Hesse aquamarine tiara to his cousin, Princess Dorothea, whose grandmother, Princess Alice of Greece, was the niece of Grand Duchess Ella. Princess Dorothea wore the Fabergé aquamarine necklace and bracelet with a diamond bandeau to the gala held in Munich on the eve of her wedding to Prince Friedrich Karl of Windisch Graz. A few years later, Princess Dorothea wore the Hesse aquamarine tiara for the wedding ball of Prince Juan Carlos of Spain and Prince Sophia of Greece at the Royal Palace of Athens in 1962. The following day, Princess Dorothea wore the Fabergé aquamarine necklace for the wedding of Prince Juan Carlos of Spain and Princess Sophia of Greece. The Hesse aquamarine tiara and Fabergé Perreur remained in Princess Dorothea's possession until 1996, when it, along with a few other heirloom jewels, was auctioned at Sotheby's. A few months later, the Hess aquamarine tiara reappeared and was worn by model Chandra North on the runway of the Versace Spring Summer Hotte Couture Show at the Ritz Hotel in Paris in January 1997, the same Ritz Hotel that Grand Duke Dimitri stayed in, following which neither the tiara nor the Perreur have ever been seen again. In 1899, Grand Duchess Ella was photographed in her golden chain necklace, which was said to be her favorite and has since disappeared. And for the fifth piece of Grand Duchess Ella's jewelry, it is her wooden cross she wore around her neck until her death. After her husband's assassination, when she decided to follow the spiritual higher life, she divided her jewels into three parts. One, she gave back to the Russian crown, and they are among the number stolen by the Bolsheviks, and served to defray the expenses of revolutionary, violent propaganda. A second part she distributed among her nearest relations, and the third and very considerable part was sold for the benefit of her charities, including the convent she founded. She kept nothing, not even her wedding ring. The only ornament she ever wore was a wooden cross hung around her neck on a white ribbon. Usually she wore gray or white cotton dresses, keeping her white woolen robes for great occasions. In order not to attract notice when she went into town, she usually wore black with a black veil over her face, but sometimes she was seen wearing her gray gown and veil and then she would be recognized and greeted with respect and veneration by Russian citizens. In the chapel built for the purpose of the Orthodox dead, whom receive Orthodox chants for two days before burial, Grand Duchess Ella watched alone by the dead, and in the solitude of the night her voice was heard repeating the words of the psalmist. The large hospitals of Moscow soon recognized the excellence of the treatment in her own hospital, where only 15 patients were received, and the most desperate cases were sent to her. 
Countess Alexandra Osoufie published the following memoir. I remember, for instance, the cook of a poor household who had burnt herself by upsetting an oil stove. The burns covered too large a surface of science to cure. No skin was left intact except on the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet. She was brought already suffering with gangrene from one of the hospitals of Moscow. The Grand Duchess herself did the dressings, which were so painful that she had to pause each moment to comfort and reassure the patient. It took two hours and a half twice a day to do the dressings, and the Grand Duchess's gown had to be aired afterwards to get rid of the terrible smell of gangrene. Yet she persevered in the treatment until at last the woman was cured to the astonishment of the doctors who had given her up. The Grand Duchess was admired by all the great surgeons, who begged for her help when they had a difficult operation to perform. She assisted the operator with wonderful calm and concentration, attentive to each wish of the surgeon. She had successfully overcome the first natural repulsion, and felt only the satisfaction of being of use. Among other things, she founded a home for incurable consumptives among women of the poorest class, and visited this house of death twice a week, so contagious is consumption. The patients often showed their gratitude by embracing her, without any thought of the danger of infection, and she never once flinched. To this home for consumptive women she was especially devoted, perhaps because her own beloved husband also struggled with tuberculosis. Her main object was to give a little comfort and a few luxuries to servants sent away when their illness was no longer in doubt, when the hospitals refused to take them in, and there was nothing left for them but death in the direst poverty. These poor creatures were cared for and nursed in a cheerful house with a big garden, where they often gained fresh hope of getting well, the Grand Duchess helping them in this. But often they passed away in peace, recommending their dear ones to their benefactress. How often a dying mother said to her, My children are no longer mine, they are yours, for they have no one in the world but you. There is no limit to the list of her good deeds or to the sums she spent. Her personal expenses were almost nothing. There were whole months when a few pence covered the cost of her entire being. She was wearing the cross when she died, buried alive by Bolsheviks in 1918. Her fellow sisters hid some of her jewels for her, and it is rumored the Mary and Martha convent still may hold on to some of these precious gems. Which of Grand Duchess Ella's pieces is your favorite?